Today we're talking with Andrew Henry of Henry Holsters. He is a holster manufacturer out of Indiana. And we're going to talk to him how he's using Maker Pipe to help him produce his holsters better and more efficient. He's come up with a lot of cool builds. And I can't wait to find out more about his business. Stay tuned. Andrew, it's it's so great to talk to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. You are um, is it owner and founder of Henry Holsters? Yep. Is that right? Owner, founder, chief janitorial officer. Everything in between. Yeah, I know the feeling. Yep. Um, but yeah, tell me, tell me a little bit about your business because you've been using Maker Pipe a lot in your business. Then we'll get to that yes. in a second. But I'd love to hear about what you guys do. So we're a specialty CNC machine shop that focuses on product design and tooling and OEM parts manufacturing for the gun holster industry. It's a pretty narrow niche market, but there's actually quite a volume of business in that space. There are a lot of firearms and a lot of holsters made and sold in the U.S. and internationally annually. It's a decent sized industry. It has some overlap with a lot of other parts of the plastics industry, but we don't do any injection molding. All of our stuff is sheet thermoforming. So we're starting with extruded sheets of PVC acrylic products like Kydex and Bolteron, and then we're designing either vacuum form tooling or compression, so matched male and female dye form tooling to make parts. And then for some of our customers, we also do all their OEM parts supply, where we design the product for them, we manufacture the tooling to make the part, and then we run the part on demand to give them inventory, either of sub-assemblies or complete retail-ready parts that we package and drop ship to their distributors. So we offer a range of just design and tooling services all the way up to we will stock the gun stores that carry your line for you if you let us know the quantities you need. So it's a neat, it's a neat industry. It has a lot of a lot of interesting challenges in it. We we're making parts every day. We don't really do any big, long, complicated projects where you might be working on a single piece for days or weeks. Uh, almost all of it, I joke, it's like it's like eating Cheetos. Like the cycle times on our CNC machines are really, really fast. A lot of our parts, when we're actually making a holster shell, the overall on machine time is under two and a half minutes per piece. And so we have a lot of a lot of efficiency goals around minimizing operator movement because operators are loading and unloading constantly, making little mobile work cells that they can reconfigure on demand for different jobs, depending on whether they're vacuum forming or compression forming, whatever they're doing to prepare the parts to go in the CNC machine. We want them to be able to bring all those tools right to that little cell right in front of the CNC machine and have everything within arm's reach. And that's one of the places we use Maker Pipe. Well, that's awesome. Thanks for the info about the business. And we'll get into how you're using Maker Pipe. And, and that's super interesting because I think you you have that opportunity with short cycle times to really yep. have an impact on your productivity and your business. So we'll, we'll get into that because I, I love talking lean and, and all those things. But how, how long have you been doing Henry Holsters for? I started making holsters in 2008 into 2009, and then I started the company uh, around 2000, late 2009, and ran it really as just a very part-time gig. I was a full-time school teacher. I taught elementary school and then taught high school, uh, and I built the holster company on the side, working by myself until I was putting in 40 to 45 hours a week in the shop, in addition to teaching full-time, and that was 2016 when I finally stepped off from teaching because I couldn't do both. Um, and then in 2017, I hired my first employee. We added a second CNC machine that year. And then we've grown since then. I now have 11 employees. We've got three CNC machines, a couple of lasers, some sewing capabilities. We've expanded into a bunch of different things that are useful for our OEM clients. And uh, just this June, moved into the building that I'm in currently. We went from our little 1200 square foot shop with a house next to it that was my office to having a 10,000 square foot industrial commercial facility that's got a loading dock and three phase power and HVAC and more than one bathroom. It's like, it's, it's amazing. It's really awesome. Oh, uh, well, congratulations, sir, on all that Thank success. Uh, a few of those points ring true with me as well, you know, in maker okay. pipe journey. Um, so How did you start that. It's uh, well, I think what you do coming from being a maker yourself and making holsters, I assume for yourself yep. and, and people, you know, um, I, I like to think of maker pipe as similar, having similar roots, right? Like I wanted to make these metal brackets that I made in my garage with my own tooling, uh, for a yep. long time, my wife and I, you know, pressing parts, um, before we, you know, really got started. 
and um, we've kind of nurtured it and bootstrapped it like it sounds you have with your business. We definitely have. Congratulations on all your success. Thank you. We're now finally getting to the scale where bootstrapping as a mode of operation starts to have diminishing returns as the default approach for our company. But absolutely, bootstrapping was everything we did up until the past year or so. Once you get to a size where the company does enough work that I can't physically even put my hands on all of it in a day, then relying on my own personal creativity and ingenuity to bootstrap things that the company overall needs no longer scales. You know, that's been a big, a big mindset shift because I was always like, oh no, we're not going to buy that. That's expensive. We'll make something. And nowadays it's just like, okay, I've got four people who need something right now. And I can only get one of those projects done today. If the other three are available as off the shelf solutions from someplace, great, wonderful. But we still want to preserve the ability to build our own things in house because when you're, you know, the 80 20 rule applies to everything, even in lean. The last 20%, the last little bit of the juice of the efficiency that you're trying to squeeze out of the system almost always requires at least, if not a fully custom solution, some ability to customize the solution and adjust it to fit your needs. So uh, we, we buy, I look when I buy things for things for the company that are adjustable, repurposable, modular, because... I don't know how we're going to use them. So certain things, we have some sort of heavy duty assembly benches that we buy from Sam's Club. They're locally available. If I need another one, I can just get it on my way to work in the morning, easy and fast. But they have you know, fixed height versions and then adjustable height versions. And for places where I know it's going to be a permanent install with tooling on top of it, and that's just a thing, we buy the fixed version. But Anywhere else where employees are going to work at it, I always buy the adjustable because I've got some employees who are five foot two and some employees who are six foot five. And those people need to be able to have their work cell configured for them. And MakerPipe has also been great for that because we can build, we can design a thing and then easily build multiple versions of it at different heights or at slightly different widths so that people who are using it get exactly what fits at their workstation. And they're not stuck dealing with a generic solution that's too tall for the short person and too low for the tall person. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it's helpful in that regard. You know, I, I, I think about the same things with maker pipe and uh, I try not to forget our DIY custom solution approach. Right. And I know what you're talking about. It, it, you yep. can think a lot of time, especially guys like us, will you know design it to the nines to fit our um, our problem specifically. But it's like it's also that's a little bit of the magic sauce that I think got a company like Henry Holsters to where you're at now, right? So you don't want to lose that part. But at the same time, you got to yeah. keep moving. So I can I can understand that balancing. I love I love making things just so. I really enjoy getting all the toothpaste out of the tube. But for most of the things that we're doing, it's less about satisfying my own ego. And it's a lot more about making sure I deliver as much value to my customers as I can in a time frame that works for them. Mm -hmm. Because a solution that is slightly less efficient to get started, but allows me to get them their initial parts two weeks earlier, whereas I could spend the next two weeks really optimizing everything in that production system. They don't actually care. The customer who's receiving the parts from me doesn't care, ex in, except that obviously the more efficient my operation is, the more flexibility I have on delivery speed and margin. If it costs me huge amounts of money to make their part because we are an absolute dumpster fire over here, then that's bad for them. But a lot of the little improvements, the last 10% is more about quality of life for the employees than it is about the bottom line for the customer. Because I want everybody, no matter where they're working in the shop, to be finishing up a day of work here and not have a sore neck and shoulders from having had to bend over a bench that wasn't the right height. Um, I want them to not have you know, aching feet from having to have having to walk a whole bunch of extra unnecessary movement throughout the day because the things they needed to were, get were stored in inconvenient places. All those things don't really change the bottom line for the customer, but they make everybody in the shop's work easier to do. They keep everybody happier. They keep everybody healthier. And that keeps the whole shop running more smoothly. Well, that's awesome. That's, that's a great goal. Um, and I'm, I'm glad MakerPipe has had a part in that. You've I remember uh, first becoming aware of you when you placed an order not too far after I um, 
went up to Ohio to see John yep. Saunders, right? Is that how yep. you got exposed to Maker Pipe? Uh, I think I'd seen it before, but as often happens, I I find out about something and I usually bookmark it and throw it in a folder in, in my Chrome browser. And then I will, when I have time, just go back and browse through that and go, you know, what things have I recently encountered? But certainly you going up to John's place reminded me of it. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. And we didn't really have much space to add new tables or racking or almost anything else new in the old shop, but it was on my to-do list months before the move that as soon as we get in the new space and we have to stand up a bunch of new assembly areas and build new racks for our tooling, all this stuff that even if we move to some more permanent welded racking for certain heavier things later, initially we can prove out all the concepts quickly and easily with maker pipe. And a lot of the stuff that we do, it works so well that there's no need to replace it with anything else. And it's, it's lightweight. It's easy to move around. Some things we put casters on, other things we just set on the floor. And it's allowed us to quickly go from me doing a napkin sketch. I hand it to Brian. He runs our little, we have a little fab shop. Can't really see it, but it's behind me over here. We've got, you know, a, a bridge port, a large band saw. We've got some other stuff, uh, a, a table saw, a, a router table, a miter saw. That's where we build all the things that we use in our main production areas in bay one and two. So anything we need to build, racks, carts, little tables, anything like that, we design it. We take measurements of the space we're actually going to put it into in the production area. But then we come back here and fab it up so that we're not having to use the production space equipment to build things for the production space. We can get it all done here, put it on a cart, roll it in there, put it in place, and then the operator just runs with it. And then usually at the end of the day or over the next few days, we will get some feedback. We have a couple of things we've made multiples of where we've gradually iterated the design. So the very first version is built this way. And the second version, we can make it, if we can make it simpler, if we can make it lighter, if we can use less EMT and fewer connectors, that makes it faster and cheaper to put together. And if it still performs the same, it's a win. So we're always looking at taking things we've already made and making little improvements. Or maybe we build a table and after we've used it for a week, the person's like, hey, it's a great size. It's a great height. It's just not quite sturdy enough. You know, the way we put it together, it doesn't handle all the weight when it's fully loaded with stuff. It feels wobbly. Then we go add some X bracing or find some other way to stiffen it up and we're right back in business. Well, that's great. Uh, it's nice to hear that. This is the first build and I've got a couple photos that you sent. Uh, I think yes. this is the first build I saw that uh, that box holder. Is that right? Is that the first yes. one? Yes. So we have one customer whose products are on that table, Filster Holsters out of Minneapolis, and we ship several of these 16 by 16 by 16 inch boxes of product for them a day. So it's a, it's a daily shipment thing that we do all the time. We have this box size standardized. We know exactly how many of each family of parts we make for them fit in it. Weight classes out very comfortably at a good UPS shipping rate. So it's not too heavy or too bulky where you start getting higher charges, higher charge rate. We wanted to be able to quickly load it and not have parts falling over inside the box. Hmm. And so we used to put the box on the table and then like tip it partway and shim under the front end of it. And it was always not quite the right height. It was too high if we had it on the same table as the parts. And it wasn't angled enough. And it was, as it got heavier and you filled it up, it would tend to stand back up and tip or tip all the way over. And so building this little rack that is just an inch or two shorter than the table itself. So when the rack is unloaded, you just grab it and you slide it under the table next to the that uh, gray bin there is packing paper. We keep enough packing paper right at the table so the person needs to fill a little bit of dead space in the box. It's within arm's reach. They don't have to walk to some other place to get it. But the little box stand fits right next to that under the table. So it stores completely out of the way. It's super lightweight. It can be easily pulled out and set up for a right or a left-handed person to load the box. It's super simple. It keeps that box securely held and we can count the parts as we go. Nothing falls over. Everything nests in tightly. And then you just pick the box up, set it on the table, tape it up, slap a label, and it goes right on our outbound shelf. So we have several of that rack now in the facility because we assemble those products in a couple of different places. And it's easiest to assemble them and then just put them right in the shipping box rather than move them around internally when they're finished in bins and then pack them again when they get to the shipping station. Uh, even stuff that gets packed back here in Bay 3, we have those same, basically a duplicate of that exact table and box stand. And as the parts are inspected and then packaged, the person who's doing the inspection packs the box and then it goes right to the front and it's ready for a label. Well, that's great. Yeah, once it worked for you in one spot, you were able to replicate it pretty easy. That's cool. 
and super the, simple. Like, hey, Brian, build me three more of these. Yeah. And we have our cut sizes. He just takes it over to the horizontal bandsaw or our little fab shop and just sections up that EMT, puts it together and out the door. Yeah, I was I was wondering what your relationship with Filster was because um, I was checking, cruising your Instagram. There's Henry Holster's, your website there. But I was choose, cruising your Instagram and I saw uh, this setup. Yes. And, uh, and this is what you're an OEM manufacturer for Filster. Is that right? Yes. So that complete assembly comes out of our shop. So everything you see behind me here in Bay 3 is all dedicated assembly area for that one product. So our two laser cutters, our sewing cell, and all the assembly tables behind me are all to build that thing. It's called the Enigma Express. It, it caught my eye because so, it's a unique product, it looks like. is it? It's a concealed carry holster. Is that right? Yes. What's unique about the Enigma system is that it is a sub belt, essentially a mounting system that you wear under your clothing. So traditionally holsters have to have some method of attaching to your belt and a gun belt is usually a heavy duty or reinforced belt that you wear through your pants loops that's designed to be able to hold the additional weight of a firearm. That presents challenges to anybody who has to dress in what we would consider formal or business wear or clothing that just doesn't have belt loops. This is especially relevant for uh, for female concealed carriers, but also anybody who they want to carry a firearm when they go out for a jog and they're wearing sweatpants or they work in law enforcement or some kind of armed security profession where they need to be able to dress in nondescript plain clothes and they want to be able to wear whatever they need to wear to blend in in the environment they're in. This entire rig is worn completely under the clothes, independent of the pants and a belt. So you can wear it with sweatpants. You can wear it with a dress. You can wear it with swim trunks. You can wear it with a tuxedo, any kind of thing that you would normally have difficulty putting a gun belt on. And because the clothing goes completely over it, it's functionally invisible, oh, which is cool. pretty wild. Yeah. But we had to add a bunch of capabilities. We had to add laser and sewing and a few of the things in the new shop to be able to manufacture all the parts that go into that assembly. That that, that struck me too, is the the mixed materials. It's not like you just have the, the holster. You have this um, looks like a fiberglass-like material. What's this braided? It's woven? actually a woven polypropylene composite called Tegris. It is a 12-ply uh, interleaved woven polypropylene tape that is then fused under heat and pressure into a single solid sheet. It's it's flexible. It's fairly thin. It's about 55, 58 thou thick. So it provides a rigid enough face plate that you can use the belt to apply leverage to it and make the gun lay flat against your body by, by basically rotating the face plate slightly. But it's thin enough that it doesn't add any significant bulk to the shape of the holster. And so it was an ideal solution for us to have a thing that gave us multiple mounting points to attach the holster to the faceplate and to loop the belt ends into the faceplate, but have the faceplate itself be flexible enough to conform to the circumference of the wearer's body and thin enough to not cause there to be an unnecessary bulge on the front of the holster. Nice. So it's a neat material. It laser cuts really nicely. Oh, cool. CO2 laser? Yep. We nice. have a couple 150 watt boss lasers. They've been great. I like them. Neat. I don't get to run them that often. I have somebody that I train to do that and now he does it. And I just walk by and go, Oh, there's my laser that I never use. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, and then you guys do, uh, I just want to hit some of your products. Um, these are some of the the magazine holders. You guys do a compensator. And then uh, is, is this kind of represent uh, representative of your, your typical product line? Yes, everything that we hosters. make under our brand is designed around concealed carry. There are lots of different applications in the holster world. There are holsters for competitive or sport shooting. There are holsters oriented around hunting. There are holsters that are oriented around uh, uniformed law enforcement and military applications. Mm -hmm. And they're all different animals. Everything that we make is oriented around concealed carry. And that means that we specialize in a range of guns that are more widely used for defensive or concealed carry. So we're not making holsters for, you know, big magnum caliber revolvers that you would carry as a backup gun if you're hunting in Alaska. We don't do that. There are companies that specialize in that, and it just doesn't overlap with what we make. We're not making holsters for really tricked out competitive race guns with really fancy optics and lots of mods on them because our clients aren't really using our gear for competitive shooting. So our designs are really purpose-driven for pretty deep concealment. If you need to have a gun and you need it to be almost impossible for somebody to see it, there's no true impossible. Everything, 
everything is a balance, but our designs are oriented around maximizing concealment for inside the waistband concealed carry firearms. And we specialize in firearms that are widely used by law enforcement. So a lot of modern polymer frame striker fired pistols in nine millimeter, 40 and 45. We don't really service any unusual magnum calibers. It really is the guns that are like the Ford Taurus and the Toyota Corolla that pretty much every major police department, every federal agency uses and issues or authorizes and approves. Cool. So so walk me through, Andrew, like what's your manufacturing process for, for the typical holster, if you don't mind? Because I think that ties into how you've maybe used Maker Pipe. So our, our process is we have basically a workflow where we start with plastic sheet. We pre-cut it down to a set size for that particular mold and tooling. Then it goes to an operator at a CNC forming cell, and they will heat the plastic up and then either vacuum form it or compression mold it, depending on what process we're using for that part. Then we have a cooling rack right there. And I actually sent you a picture of one of the cooling racks. Oh, yeah. Let me um, bring that it's up. Just, it's, just a, it's just a wire frame on a little maker pipe stand, kind of like our box rack. You, you have two fans there, and there's actually a third one overhead pointed directly down. So we've got three air movers pointed at that little rack. Mm -hmm. This was sort of a proof of concept when we put together. It needs a few improvements. We've got that, you know, basically glorified wire rack just zip tied on the top of it. It's ugly, but it works fine. And we'll refine the design later if we need to. But the parts get cool on that rack, and then the operator loads them directly into the CNC machine. And the machine will engrave any branding information, any model information that marks the part, drill any holes that are needed to attach the belt clips or any other hardware, and then trim the outline of the part. And then it gets polished. The edges get buffed so that all the sharp corners and editing are deburred and the edges are blended and smooth. And then the part gets assembled, um, depending on what kind and size of belt clip is spec for that part. And then we do 100% test fitting on every holster we make. So we have a library of real firearms. And if we make 500 units of something, we actually test fit the actual firearm in every single one of the 500 units before the ship. And so we have two four by eight foot maker pipe tables that are our inspection tables. And they're right by our assembly area. And as the products are completed, they get laid out on those tables. Those bins of parts are parts that are waiting to be laid out to be inspected. Mm -hmm. And they'll go on the second table that's cleared off behind there. And then they get a visual inspection and then they get test fitting. And then they would get packaged right there on that table and the little box stand is right there and they go right in the box and out the door. So we try to minimize how much the parts have to move around the shop. We don't want to have big racks of work in process where we're like rolling big wire racks of partially filled bins of things around. Our goal almost always is when we start a job at the CNC machine, I want it to ship complete by the end of the next business day. Oftentimes we can ship part of the job the same business day, depending on how much we can get the parts to flow through the process. So we really want, if we're, if the person at the CNC is making 200 parts, when they've got the first 20 or 30 done, those parts will already start flowing over to the buffing and finishing station. And then as soon as that person has the first bin of 30 parts buffed, that will flow directly to the assembly area. And while the raw parts are still being manufactured at the other end of the shop, at the other end of the room, a person's putting together finished units ready for test fitting. And we know that we can get, you know, maybe 40 of those into a box. And so the person at the CNC might be 110 units into their run. And the first 40 units are already ready to be packaged and ship out that day. So we, we like the flexibility of having these lightweight tables and stuff can just move around really, really easily. We have also little double tray racks that we keep at our assembly benches. Um, this guy. Yep. So we have these clear Sterilite bins and very often we'll have an operator doing assembly on that bench and then we'll work parts bin to bin. So we have the raw shells that come from buffing and then they'll get a belt clip attached and go into the next bin. And then that, those bins just gets handed off to the next table where a person does the next step of the assembly. And then they go right to our inspection table and get finished out and packaged from there. So that rack as well. It just slides right under that bench. So when we're not using it and it doesn't have bins in it, it fits under the table. So it goes right out of the way. We don't have to find some other place to stash it. Mm -hmm. And if we need to use it, we just pull it out, drop some bins in it. When we're done with it, put it away. And we also can take that. We have a couple of those as well. You can take that and use that as a little two bin rack at a drill press station, at a bandsaw station, at a buffing station, any place where you're working parts bin to bin, or you're cutting stock down to size and you've got your larger pieces and then your finished pre-cuts, 
rather than cutting something, setting it down on your left, reaching over to your right, picking up the next thing and then cutting it, you cut something, you set it, you grab the next, you cut it, you set it, you grab the next, you cut it. And the amount of motion is minimized. And also we have two of the same size bins. So stuff just fits. Like if you have a bin worth of parts and you add a belt clip to them and put them in the next bin, you still have a bin's worth of parts. And you're not constantly shifting back and forth between now I need a big bin and now I need a small bin and half the parts are over there. So everything sort of flows through the shop in those size bins. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I can tell you are focused on lean concepts, which is really cool to see. And I, I have to say thank you for, you know, sharing your production method and uh, how you use MakerPipe. It's really cool to get a look at your process and in your shop and how you're doing it. I, I think that's great that you're sharing that. Happy to do it. We Our YouTube channel hasn't been updated much in a while, and that's because I've been busy enough with the move and getting into the new space that I haven't had a lot of time to shoot video. But Generally, we run a pretty open shop. There's not a lot that we do that's very proprietary. We have some customers, we do their OEM work privately and don't disclose who, who we're doing the work for. And so we have some parts and some processes that, that are specific to those products that we don't show. Most of what we make is pretty generally applicable across our entire product line. And there really isn't anything new that we've invented. All the actual forming methods and the machining, it's all... It's all adapted from other industries, and we're just right-sizing it to our space, our machines, and our products. So yeah. we do a lot of vacuum work holding. I'm good friends with Jay Pearson at Pearson Automation. We use a lot of his work holding because that allows us to standardize all of our fixturing across our three CNC machines. Um, we have standardized tooling sets that go in each machine so that anything that we can build a process and a system around so the operators are not having to keep things in memory not having to look out for weird exceptions. We just want things to be consistent. So whether you're loading parts for shipping over in bay one or you're loading parts for shipping back here in bay three, it's going to be the same size box, the same tape dispenser, the same packaging materials, the same box stand, the same table height. Everything is just consistent. We're not making it up in slightly different ways in different places. Anywhere we can, find what works and then roll it out. Mm. Yeah, and make life a lot easier. And, and I noticed too, uh, a section on your website where you, you not only sell your product, but you have yep. maker, holster maker accessories as well. That fits right yes, in with your openness of the shop and your openness of the, your manufacturing process. The holster making industry has thousands of small DIY shops in it because uh, conceptually holster manufacturing is relatively simple. And I started like many small holster shops have started I, I used to heat my plastic with a toaster oven that I got, got from Goodwill for $6. And you could just put a small piece, enough plastic for one holster at a time in there and heat it up. It was slow and the temperature settings were like, you know, accurate to plus or minus 80 degrees. So it was just a total, you know, kind of a crapshoot whether or not your plastic would get to an optimal forming temperature or whether you would get it a little too hot and scorch it. So I definitely scrapped a lot of material early on. But all you need really is uh, an analog, either a, a firearm, a replica firearm, or a cast mold of a firearm to use as your tooling. You need a way to heat plastic. And then a lot of guys just use plywood plates with high temperature neoprene foam and hand clamps to basically make a press and you smush the plastic around your mold. Mm -hmm. That process can make very, very serviceable holsters and it's dirt cheap. You can get everything you need to make a holster for under a hundred bucks and then make a few holsters. So what we've done is we've started to either source or make and sell tooling that's geared more toward the small volume production shop, a holster maker who's doing it at least generously full part-time or full-time. And they want a little robust vacuum forming system. They want the filters that keep those vacuum lines clean. We've released, um, I probably have about 65 hours worth of video on my YouTube channel. We did a whole series called that dates back, you know, ran for several years. And it was just lots of, you know, hour to hour and a half videos of me showing what I was working on, showing the tooling, showing what I was designing, explaining how we do it. And that was one of the ways that I disseminated everything that I've learned about how to make holsters and how to use the tools that we've made for ourselves. And then there was enough interest that it made sense to start selling those tools to other holster makers. For a while, I did a lot more freelance mold design where I designed just tooling for other holster shops. But as we got busier and busier actually making OEM parts, 
it became less and less feasible to do a lot of freelance design work because once the mold design is done, that project is closed and it doesn't generate any actual throughput for our production staff to work on. So I've become much more heavily focused on jobs that we will OEM once the design is finished. Gotcha. Well, I think that's really cool that you're so open with the process. You're helping other people uh, use this technology um, and at a maker level. It that's wasn't that cool. way when I got started. In 2008, 2009, there were far fewer holster companies in the space doing stuff that I like I currently do. It was a very tight-lipped industry. It was very hard to get any information out of anybody. Uh, holster making uses some specialty fasteners, a few little bits, nods, and ends that were hard to find. Nobody would tell you where they got anything from because having their own proprietary unique hardware was a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. You asked earlier about the connection to Filster. Filster is owned by my good friend, John Hoffman. He and I got started around the same time. I think he started in 2011. And he has a YouTube channel called Philly EDC. He used to be in Philadelphia. That's why the company is you know, a portmanteau of Filster Holster, Filster. But he video documented the entire process of learning to make holsters in his apartment in Philadelphia and now has a multi-million dollar company that makes some of the best concealment holsters in the world. And we work collaboratively on the designs and then we OEM all his parts. It was a wave of openness and disclosure of process and discovery that really started with a handful of holster makers on YouTube publishing everything they, they were doing. The number, the number of people who have seen those videos, especially the ones that John did in 2011, 2012, and started a holster company because of it, thousands of people, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, the same way that on Instagram, the machinist community in 2015, 2016 was small, but was very open, very sharing. Guys would tell you all kinds of things if you just asked them. And that has created now, five years later, an incredibly lively, wide ranging community of people doing all kinds of machining in all kinds of different industries, different kinds of machinery, different applications, different materials. And the amount of information that's now just freely available is mind boggling. You know, obviously, if you're doing ITAR work or you're doing stuff that's under NDA or, you know, you're Elon Musk's personal machinist, you can't post your stuff. But a lot of small businesses like me, most of what we do isn't that proprietary. And it's fascinating for other people to learn from us how we do stuff. But also I'll publish a video and then somebody will DM me and say, hey, I saw you doing this thing. We do something similar, but we do it this other way. And I never would have encountered that person. I didn't know about their page and they might never have published anything about that specific tool or that process. But me putting out what I do prompted them to go, oh yeah, I recognize that. I have some tips and tricks that this guy could use. Right. And so uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was on the uh, Within Tolerance podcast with Dylan Jackson from Proteum Machining. And I was talking about some problems we have with a specific uh, carbide end mill that we use a lot of. And yesterday evening, I got an email from a guy who was like, hey, I just listened to that podcast. We cut a lot of the same kind of material. Here's this vendor that you didn't mention. I don't know if you know of them, but here's the vendor we use. They have a part that's analogous to the one you're using. Check them out. So this morning, right before I got on here, I went and ordered a couple of those end mills to try them out. But I never would have found them if I hadn't disclosed what I was doing. And then that guy heard it and said, oh. I can pay it forward. I know something that Andrew doesn't. And there's tons and tons and tons of people and tons of things out there that I don't know and I would never discover if I didn't put myself out there first and create that openness to criticize my process, make suggestions about my process, comment on whatever we're doing. Like, I wow. love to learn stuff from people who know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's so and great. As you can and tell, it... I also love coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Cheers to that. It, it, it struck me right away. Uh, your openness for sharing your process and everything. And I, I really think that's cool. And and shout out to the pioneers that that have been doing that for a while, right? Because it sounds like your industry and definitely the machining uh, is a product of people like John Saunders with NYC CNC, who is just so yep. forthcoming with the information. I, I am absolutely, and my business is a product of that uh, John Saunders. And that was, it was such an honor to get into a shop and meet him personally uh, because the information he shared taught me how to, or gave me the confidence to try to do my own tooling for a stamping machine, yeah. right? And totally, and yeah. Like, uh, I see that in in what you do. So it's shout out to those guys because I really uh, laid the groundwork for an entire community of machinists or holster makers or um, you know any any different number of different people. So uh, going to really somebody cool. else's shop in person is always an incredibly enlightening experience. But even just getting a glimpse into somebody's shop through videos that they publish just 
widens the horizons of what you then realize is possible to do. Yeah. The, the number of small shops where one or two guys with a couple of good machines are putting out ridiculous volumes of world-class work from some unmarked building in, you know, in Oregon. It's like, how? I never would have thought. Right. And, and we're in a basically unmarked building in, you know, a not very industrial area. My, our neighbors are a church, a nursing home, and a mini storage. We're not in an industrial park. We're just out in the country on this one section outside town that was zoned commercial 25 years ago. And that means that, you know, we're hiding in plain sight. And there are lots and lots and lots of companies that are within a 10 minute drive of that are hiding in plain sight, but they don't publish anything on the internet. I'll never hear about them. Mm -hmm. And so I have a lot more in common with dudes in New Mexico and dudes in Maine who are vlogging and showing what they're doing and what they're designing and what they're machining and what they're selling. Like I learned tons of stuff from them, even though there are huge amounts of institutional knowledge and experience and expertise all around us. You can't, you can't find it. It's, it's hard to cold call someplace and say, Hey, I saw your building. I think that you might do some things that are interesting to me. Can I just show up and take an hour of your time and have you show me around? That's a hard ask. Sure. But as soon as somebody videos their shop for half an hour and then releases it, you get that time for free at scale. If that video gets a million views, like that's amazing. Yeah. And that amazing. there's a there's a pretty strong generational divide there. There aren't that many older guys doing that. I have huge respect for dudes like Tom Lipton um, because he puts out an enormous amount of material. Like I love watching Tom Lipton's videos, Robin Renzetti. There's a handful of other guys who are masters of their craft and have had, you know, 30, 40, 50 years in industry. And they, they have forgotten more stuff than I will ever know. And the only way to learn from those kinds of guys used to be to end up at a shop with them and then get them to talk to you, you know, find the crustiest oldest guy in the shop and pick yeah. his brain. Right. And that is, that's not an approach that's able to keep up with the scale of manufacturing that we need. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you can't. And every time one of those guys retires or dies or forgets something, it's gone. And I'm really excited to be at the forefront, front edge of what the digital library of information can do for the entire world of manufacturing, because processes will change, machines will change, people will change. But a lot of the basic principles and ideas and how they're executed are basically timeless. And there's going to be videos that got put on YouTube in 2008, 2010, 2012, that 20 years from now, high schoolers are still going to watch them and go, oh, whoa. I didn't know that. And the ability to create those kinds of durable resources, it's so exciting. Like, yeah, making a YouTube video takes some time and editing video is a drag. I don't like editing video at all. But the benefits of having that information documented and out there for free, forever, for anybody who wants it, mm -hmm. the upside on that to the whole community is so huge that it's just, it's a, it's a huge win. And I get, I get really excited about it. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And and I think for American manufacturing as well, that is so critical because you're right. To understand manufacturing, you had to get into the back of the shop, into the tool room with the oldest tool maker and have access to him and get him some coffee and get him to talk, right? But uh, yep. for a, a new breed of companies that are trying to be good at manufacturing, American manufacturing, which is a challenge, um, sharing that information and inspiring the next person that's going to create that next American manufacturing company is really cool as well. So I think for manufacturing just in this country, uh, which I'm very passionate about, is uh, really great that you're doing that and other people are doing that. Yeah, I get so psyched. And the other cool thing that like the Instagram machinist community has helped uh, clarify or reveal is how much even shops with very similar capabilities often aren't each other's competition at all. The market is so big and the number of available niches and specializations that are out there means that, you know, the number of shops that have a couple of Haas VF2s, thousands and thousands of shops have a couple of Haas VF2s, but you're not in competition with everybody else who has that machine. Mm -hmm. You might be in a very narrow niche where only a few companies in the country do what you do or do it as well as you do it. 
And part of the thing that's been so inspiring to me is seeing how much certain successful companies have done that by becoming the best in the world at a very specific narrow band of things. And then like, you're only running against yourself. There, you're not, like, there's a, there are a couple of much bigger machine shops within 20 minutes of me. I'm not a job shop. I don't compete with them for anything. I know the owners every once in a while, if they need some overflow machining, they job some small parts out to us. But like, I'm, I'm never in my life going to try to take work away from them. I don't need to. They, they're doing a completely different thing than I am, even though a lot of the tooling and the machinery is very similar. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that we can safely share information because we're not threatened by the people, even who are geographically close to us, because they're not our competition. That is in incredibly freeing. And it makes it a lot less scary. Like if you're like, if I give this away, I won't have enough for myself. That's not actually true in a lot of cases. And it's an understandable fear. And the, you know, the economy has been super volatile for the past two years. It's not a safe world, but there is also an enormous amount of work out there. And there's an increasing interest and appetite for reshoring all kinds of things that got offshored a long time ago and that nobody thought would ever come back. Well, I, th I think we could both talk about this topic for a long time. We could. We <laughs> yeah. could. And that's awesome. Thanks for having me on. It's 1150. I actually need to run. I've got a 12 o'clock meeting I need to get ready for. But David, thank you so much for having me on. It was a real pleasure. Were there any last questions you had you wanted to ask before I jet? Well, the only thing I have left is, there, is there anything that I can do for you? I appreciate your time, but can MakerPipe do anything more for you? Well, I think there are a few things that I've talked with my employee, Brian, who does most of our MakerPipe builds. A few ideas we've been batting around, and I actually haven't been back to look through the MakerPipe catalog in a while. He handles most of our ordering of parts. And I know you guys have released some new connectors and other things since I last. So I need to take a look back through the catalog and see, because oftentimes just looking at things, just like flipping through and looking at everything that's available prompts lots of ideas for me. Um, but at the moment, I think we're good. But if there are other ideas I have for different connectors or different things I want to build, and they're not currently in the system, I'd love to talk to you about how your design process for connectors work, what the design constraints are, and what's involved in prototyping things. If I come up with something unique that I look at and go, oh, if we could just do this, it's an elegantly simple solution to build this one thing that I want to build. So yeah. we're going to keep using Maker MakerPipe all the time. We keep a bunch of EMT on our bar stock rack. And anytime we get low on connectors, Brian just orders more so that anytime I have an idea, I can just come running back here and say, Brian, Brian, I need a thing that's this size, this shape, like, and I need it like in the next hour. I want to try this idea out. And he can just go cut up some plywood, cut up some EMT, throw it together and give me a proof of concept right there. And that's super fun. And then if we decide it didn't work, then we take it apart. We used up a piece of EMT and we just put the connectors back on the shelf and go again the next time I have some harebrained scheme. <laughs> well, Which that's is often. Yeah. I have a lot of those. That's awesome. Well, I... Thank you so much for the business. Shout out to Brian for making all this cool stuff. And whenever you want to talk about any idea like that, I'm always uh, here to talk. So thank you. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, David. Have a great day. You too. Take care.